Hello and welcome to the Death Mountaineers YouTube channel, my name is Mikeru. If you're new to the channel, let me make one thing super clear. I love Pokemon, my dudes. So what I've decided to do is start my first ever video series with new episodes premiering once a month, in which I'm going to be breaking down the Pokemon universe piece by piece until it fits into a cereal bowl and goes down nice and easy with some milk. Or almond milk for you alternative types. Lactaid. Whatever. If you don't know much about the universe these games take place in, let me put this undertaking into perspective for you. For the past 20 years, the Pokemon Company has produced about 80 individual Pokemon games, including non-canon spin-offs, split the timeline into two separate universes, produced hundreds of comics, 20 feature-length movies, an anime pushing 1,000 episodes, as well as two more games confirmed on the way, and a mystery main series title coming to the brand new Nintendo Switch. That's a lot of content. That's a lot of nuts! So let's kick this off with a not-so-simple question, what is a Pokemon? The simple answer, that right there. But why is that a Pokemon? It looks kinda like a rat to me, hell, it even acts like a rat, but somehow these two things are different. One's a Pokemon, and the other, well, it's a rat. Oh, hey, Hilda. Guys, this is Hilda, creator of Hilda World and a partner of the National Dex, hosted by Pokakels and Alex Fasciani. Dude, I'm about to get into some messed up shit. Do you want to help me out here? Yeah, dude, that is what you're paying me for, right? Uh, yeah, totally. Alright, so we would assume that Pokemon are just real-world animal equivalents, but that isn't the case. There are many examples of real-life animals appearing in the anime or even being referenced in the Pokedex. So we know animals and Pokemon are definitely separate, which is strange in and of itself. Your god may tell you different, but we humans are just animals as well. A rat and a human share much more in common than a rat and a ratata. In fact, comparing animals to Pokemon is like comparing a fish to a tree. Totally different life forms. So in the Pokemon world, there isn't six scientific kingdoms of life, there are seven. However, since Pokemon share so many characteristics with animals, let's take a scientific approach to this first question. Big words alert! Animals are multicellular eukaryotic organisms of the kingdom Animalia, also called Metazoa. Now don't worry so much about the name Metazoa, but eukaryotic just means that the cells of animals have a nucleus. Now the animal kingdom emerged as a clade, or a group of organisms that consist of a common ancestor and all its lineal descendants within a Poakazoa, which is an older genetic group, as the sister to the chronoflagellates, which are the closest living relatives to the animal kingdom. Animals are motile. Meaning they can move spontaneously and independently at some point in their lives. Their body plan eventually becomes fixed as they develop, although some undergo a process of metamorphosis later in their lives, like butterflies. All animals are heterotrophs. They must ingest other organisms or their products for sustenance. Now, besides all the super science squad talk, basically Pokemon are not animals. Why? Because not all Pokemon are heterotrophs. Many Pokemon, particularly the grass types, have the ability to make their own energy through synthesis or chlorophyll, making them autotrophs. But Pokemon aren't plants, either. There's also Pokemon who gain sustenance from gems like Sableye, or Pokemon like Onyx who eat only rocks. Now, before we try to classify these creatures, we have to take a look one step deeper into the mythos. However, unlike the world we live in, we know the creatures these myths revolve around are real in the Pokemon world. So let's start from the beginning. It starts. There was only a churning turmoil of chaos. At the heart of chaos, where all things became one, appeared an egg. Having tumbled from the vortex, the egg gave rise to the original one. From itself, two beings the original one did make. Time started to spin, space began to expand. From itself again, three living things the original one did make. The two beings wished and from them, matter came to be. The three living things wished and from them, spirit came to be. The world created, the original one took to unyielding sleep. So, at the very beginning of the timeline, we have Arceus, otherwise known as the original one. He was number one! Being formed or created or simply popping into existence, and Arceus then in turn created Dialga and Palkia, the beings of time and space, and apparently used all their powers combined to form matter and the universe, as well as indirectly creating antimatter and Garatina, and then Arceus took a long ass nap. So, Pokemon created the entire fucking universe, alright, by science. But what I like about this is that this doesn't go so far as to say that Arceus is an all-knowing, all-watching, benevolent white boy. Arceus isn't sitting atop his throne dictating the universe and shaming you for touching yourself, no! He was just bored and lonely so he made some things and then got sleepy. 
Sure, he has power beyond our wildest dreams, but as far as we know, only in the creation department. Other Pokémon are meant for other tasks, like time and space. Let's just be thankful that despite their astronomic capabilities, these Pokémon are more forces of nature rather than gods, though their origins reflect some of our Earth's most prominent religions and philosophies. This is Biblical Creationism, Shinto Creationism, Zen Buddhism, and the Big Bang Theory into one neat parcel. Obviously, Arceus can reflect the one god or monotheistic aspect of Biblicism. A singularity like the egg, though, is symbolic of both the Buddhist concept of the universe as well as the Big Bang theory. Despite the contents of the egg eventually taking shape into many things, everything is still a part of the egg. However, the Shinto religion revolves around multiple gods and beings of creation, so check it out. Heaven and Earth were separated. Initially, both were combined into a substance analogous to an egg. As this composition separated, the purer, clear element rose out, forming heaven. The denser, impure substance sank to become earth. Heaven formed easily, thus was completed first. Earth, however, evolved with more trouble, and therefore developed later. The egg imagery is definitely not a coincidence. Both Shinto and Pokémon creationism talk about an egg forming among chaos. Now we also have the Shinto creation of Earth. In the beginning, when the universe was created from the pre-existing chaos, a number of kami appeared spontaneously. Two specifically called Izanagi and Izanami, who were brother and sister. And they were also lovers. Because Japan. Izanagi means he who invites, and Izanami means she who invites. Izanagi and Izanami thrust a jeweled spear into the ocean, and the first land formed where the spear touched the water. This was the central island of Japan. And where does Arceus rest the top? Spear Pillar. It's well known that in the Pokémon universe, Japan is represented by the regions within the first four games, Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, and Sinnoh. Now Sinnoh is said to be the point of creation for the Pokémon world. It's also the resting place of Arceus, Dialga, and Palkia, as well as the location of Spear Pillar. In our universe, the Sinnoh region is known as Hokkaido. This location accounts for the northern portion of the Japanese archipelago. Hokkaido was home to an ancient Japanese ethnic group known as the Ainu. In fact, before taking the title of Hokkaido, it was known as Izochi, Land of the Ainu. Hokkaido is known for its diverse and unique wildlife and landscape, as well as the spiritual nature of the land thanks to the Ainu. These people worshipped many animal gods as well as the spirits of the dead. In particular, their god of the sky, Kandakoro Kamoe, is undoubtedly the archetype from which Arceus was cast. Though an extremely powerful Kamoe, he's not a supreme being like the Christian god. He's more of a background figure, or a creator and a delineator, much like Arceus. So if Pokémon, as well as everything else, came from a singularity, why are there so many now? And where the hell did humans come from in relation? Did Pokémon create humans? It would make sense, seeing as Arceus and company created everything else. To answer this new question, it is best to look at the relationship between Pokémon and humans and how the human part of their world has developed and changed. Right, so first, let's look at some literature from the Canalave Library. There once were Pokémon that became very close to humans. There once were humans and Pokémon that ate together at the same table. It was a time when there existed no differences to distinguish the two. There's also Sinnoh Folk Story number two. There lived a Pokémon in a forest. In the forest, the Pokémon shed its hide to sleep as a human. Awakened, the human dons the Pokémon hide to roam villages. This seems to point towards real-world evolution, not the fake Pokémon kind, which is technically more of a metamorphosis, but we'll get into that in a later video. I don't buy this theory. Instead, this could be a reference to how Jewish, Christian, and Islamic scriptures say that everything living is made from clay or the earth. Technically, everything was sculpted from Arceus's egg in the same way. Everything was the same at one point, so everything ate at the same table, if you get my drift. However, that is not the end. In a similar folktale, we also get... Long ago, when Sinnoh had just been made, Pokémon and humans led separate lives. That is not to say they did not help each other. No, indeed they did. They supplied each other with goods and supported each other. A Pokémon proposed to the others to always be ready to help humans. It asked that Pokémon be ready to appear before humans always. Thus, to this day, Pokémon appear to us if we venture into tall grass. Now this seems a little contradictory to the previous folktale, as people and Pokémon are all of a sudden separate entities, unless we put it into the context of taking place long after the first two folktales. We know that the point of origin in the Pokémon world is Sinnoh, 
meaning that Pokemon and people also originated in this region. The folktale says that people and Pokemon are already separate when Sinnoh had just been made, meaning that when they were the same, it was before the creation of Sinnoh. Pokemon and people being the same is a metaphorical statement. It's trying to depict the idea of everything being from the same singularity. You, your car, your dog, it's all just stardust in the big scheme of things. But if Sinnoh is the origin of the Pokemon world or even the Pokemon universe, where did people come from? Well, there is a theory my friend Kelly has been working on which depicts humans coming through a rift in time and space. Creation is hot and messy. These offspring of Arceus are known for leaving gaping holes in reality, doors to other dimensions, wormholes. Think about Dialga and Palkia, Hoopa. Any of these Pokemon could be responsible for this gateway between realities. It is not completely implausible. The only problem with it is that the timelines wouldn't align properly. Her theory would mean people entered the Pokemon universe at the beginning of their universe, a time in which humans didn't exist and wouldn't for billions of years. However, simple understanding of rudimentary quantum mechanics can solve that issue. You see, time and space are linked. That's why you hear Doc Brown prattle on about the space-time continuum. Now, if you manipulate time, something in space, whether physical or not, will also be affected. So by bypassing the barriers of space, for example, forming a wormhole, which is a violent rip in the fabric of reality, you could theoretically time travel, thus allowing humans to enter the Pokemon world without breaking the timeline. While Dialga and Palkia were setting that time-space stuff up, maybe some humans were swept up by some fourth dimensional clutter which flung them to the very beginning of the Pokemon universe. But before I get too deep into that mess, let's finally answer the question that has taken us on this crazy roller coaster. We're gonna do that by taking a look at Mew. You see, Mew was the ancestor of all Pokemon and was said to have a native breeding ground in South America. Now obviously, this is a little odd since South America doesn't exist in the Pokemon universe and wasn't retconned until after Gen 3, so how can we make heads or tails out of this blatant continuity error? Well, Mew could have come from the same world the humans did. Think about it, Mew has a striking resemblance to a fetus and is easily cloned from a fossilized eyelash, even though fossilized DNA completely degrades after a few thousand years. It could be possible that Mew was some form of cloning experiment in our Earth, and then got sucked up into the world of Pokémon where it was set free and its unstable DNA structure allowed it to adapt to the various environments of the land. Or perhaps it was shitty writing. Or maybe there is a South America in the Pokémon world? It's possible. Kind of. But regardless, Mew is what we call a common ancestor. We all have one. Some unwitting sea creature from millions and millions of years ago ended up as your ass down the line. Well, for Pokemon, that was Mew. This creature, most likely created as a seed of sorts to sow the land, developed into all Pokemon, big and small, due to its incredibly malleable DNA. Are you ready for this? I'm ready! Because we have our answer, we know what these creatures are, and why they defy classification according to our world's scientific principles. It's because Pokemon are extra-dimensional aliens. Is such a thing even possible? Yes, it is. And to them, so are we. When the dimensional rift opened up, be it by Dialga or Palkia or maybe even Hoopa playing a prank, ancient humans arrived in Sinnoh and were greeted by Pokemon. People and Pokemon lived together across dimensions until the doorway was suddenly sealed tight once and for all, cutting off the human world from the Pokemon one and trapping the people of Sinnoh forever. Now why did this happen? Well, it's because of the predatory aspect of human nature. Here is the account of what caused this interdimensional door to forever shut between the world we know and the one full of Pokemon. It's a passage known as Veilstone's Myth, also from the Sinnoh region. A young man, callow and foolish in innocence, came to own a sword. With it, he smote Pokemon, which gave sustenance with carefree abandon. Those not taken as food he discarded with no afterthought. The following year, no Pokemon appeared. Larders grew bare. The young man seeking the missing Pokemon journeyed afar. Long did he search, and far and wide too, until one he did find. Asked he, why do you hide? To which the Pokemon replied, if you bear your sword to bring harm upon us, with claws and fangs we will exact a toll. From your kind we will take our toll, for it must be done. Done it must be to guard ourselves, and for it I apologize. To the skies the young man shouted his dismay. In having found the sword I have lost so much, gorged with power I grew blind to Pokemon being alive. I will never fall savage again, this sword I denounce and forsake. I plead for forgiveness, for I was but a fool. 
So saying, the young man hurled the sword to the ground, snapping it. Seeing this, the Pokémon disappeared to a place beyond seeing. When this gate was sealed, the remaining humans in Sinnoh were sealed with it. The Pokémon left the world we live in currently and returned to Sinnoh, forever locking the passage between the two dimensions. And since then, Pokémon and the remaining humans have been coexisting in the Pokémon world, while the human universe... Guys, there is so much more to cover here. This is just a pebble on the tip of the iceberg of the world that the creators of Pokémon have built, and I hope you enjoyed and you continue to join me as I tear this universe down and try to make sense of everything. Hilda, my dude, thank you for helping me out so much with this one. Having a Poké professional on the show was a total honor. It was absolutely my pleasure. You can send the invoice to me later. I will send you my email. I am getting paid for this, right? Um, anyway, if uh, you haven't checked out Hilda's personal channel, Hilda World, go give that a watch. It's entirely Pokemon based and I'm a huge fan. Also, big thanks to Pokekels as well for her awesome ideas and being a huge help and inspiration. So go check out the National Dex channel for more Kells, Hilda, and the best Pokemon content on the web. Finally, a special shout out to Gaffa Cakes for helping me write this, and Tricycle for going over my script with me and sending a few of you my direction. What would you guys like to see me cover next time? Let me know in the comments below, and in the meantime, check out some of my other videos. As always, if you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe and hit that like button if you liked the video. I'm Mike Aru, and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching. Alright, peace. <laughs>